Bye. Now I'm like PewDiePie. Ooh. <laughs> Except I shouldn't. Uh, yeah. Now Goodbye. we're just now we're just copying content, huh? Uh, yeah, I feel like th this this isn't gonna go in the actual podcast. Like that's what you I think. Assume... Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode two of Over Inspected. I'm your host. Well, I'm one of the three hosts, Carrie Huang, and with me I've got Chai and Manu. Yeah, and I think this. Uh... Yeah, in, yeah. You guys can introduce yourself again. You know, I'm, I'm gonna be honest. I was like wondering, like, do are the way you're pointing? I wonder if it's gonna show. I'll point in both <laughs> directions. Like this way, we'll one of us it is right. It's fine. Yeah. If we end up in the wrong direction, who cares, man? <laughs> yeah. It, oh, no, if, man. if I point in the wrong direction, it reflects off of the wall on the side. Yeah. Of the exactly. Screen. Oh, oh. Exactly. So it's, it's like a light it's, beam. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's clever. <laughs> like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was trying to see if I could have a laser pointer, but I didn't. I don't think they would be able to see a laser pointer also, right? Because if you, like, pointed the... Like, you would have to have... You oh. know, like, those mists? Like, you need to have I... the mist in order to see the laser pointer. Yeah, I would need a mist machine and a laser pointer, which is too much for a simple podcast like this one. So, I had a question. Manu. Yeah? Yeah. Oh. Carrie, you too. We just had dinner. Manu, how was the curry? One out of ten. So I think Japanese curry. I think the curry was really good. Uh, I have like a I have a soft spot for I think Japanese curry. I think it was a little runny. Oh okay, yeah that's fair. It was a little bit runny, but you know what? It was jam packed with flavor. So if I had to give mm -hmm. it a one out of ten, one through ten, I'd probably give it a solid six. It was pretty good. Yeah yeah I think so. I think also it could use a bit more rice. L little more rice. little low on the rice side, but. Otherwise, no major qualms. Uh, six out yeah. of ten for me as well. Carrie, what'd that you? That sounds good. Yeah, um, I had a fish burrito that my dad bought and brought home. Um, I only ate half of it because it was like really big. Um, yeah. But I would rate that. Well, you guys both said six, right? So. <laughs> you I can also say, say six. I was gonna also say. I was also gonna say six, but then people are gonna be like six, six, six. This seems a little mm. satanic to me. A I, little bit satanic. I guess you're ready, yeah. So I'll just, I'll rate it. I don't want to go up to seven though, and five sounds just, just, harsh. Just put it 6.1, 6.1. 6.1, yeah. yeah, I rated it a 6.1. It was actually better uh, than our meals then, yeah. You couldn't have rated it a 6.25? Hmm? Oh, that's true, I could rate it Mitch. 6.25. Yeah, yeah. I, rate I, it a, I rate it Mitch out of 10. I rate it Mitch <laughs> out of 10. So it was like, that means it's like a pretty decent fish burrito. Um, yeah, pretty good. Not, not too bad. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think like with okay, I guess we, we could we could transfer to like what this episode's going to be about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think today we're going to just talk about our kind of personal origin stories, how we got into speed cubing, maybe how we got into podcasting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 I think uh, I think that this this episode is going to be a long one. I think there's. There's a lot. There's a lot of story between I think the three of us that we could just we just go on forever and ever. Yeah. I definitely feel like mine's probably the most boring or probably the most basic. But wait, wait. So let, let let's start with the the, the like the most simple one, right? Like, where, yeah. how did you how did you guys get into cubing? Because considering that this is a somewhat cubing podcast. Yeah. Um. Well, for me, um, I technically first solved a cube when I was in the ninth grade. Um, my friend actually bought this like really cool speed cube. I have no idea what it was. It was like a white plastic speed cube. And uh, we were just solving it together, learning it together. And I got pretty fast at it. I think I used beginner's method all the way until like 35, 40 seconds. Um, That's pretty fast. And, and like, yeah, it was pretty fast. And then I just stopped all the way until I graduated college. So I actually had not touched a puzzle since then. Mm. Um, and then that summer was like really boring, so I just picked up a cube again because it was in my room. And then I figured out this whole world of speed cubing, and I sub 25, sub 20, sub 15. Um, so I, I essentially had this like three year gap of when I learned it versus when I took it serious. That at least for me. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that, that actually mirrors basically my cubing as well. So I first started cubing when I was in middle school. Um, this was, I think, right when cubing was, like, picking up again. Uh, so, so some people might know, like, originally, like, cubing originally was really, really big in the 80s when the Rubik's Cube first came out. I think it won, like, Toy of the Year or whatever. 
The first, I think, World Cube Championships were held in 1982 or 83. Um, and But after that, you know, Cuban kind of went on a huge lull. Um, to the point where I think, like, if you ask people about it now, I think people are still like, oh, I thought the Rubik's Cube died out. Um, but I, I think when I was in middle school, it was catching back up again. Uh, almost certainly because of YouTube. So my friends actually learned how to cube first. And then they were like, oh, haha, you can't do it. Like, you, you suck or whatever. I'm like, what do you mean? So then I, I also learned how to cube. But then they were faster than me. And they were like, oh, but you can, you might be able to know, you might be able to solve a cube, but uh, you can't do it fast. So then I started getting a little bit faster. But uh, I remember in my school, it was to the point where we would just bring cubes to class. So we would cube in the middle of class. And then, uh. you know, at some point cubing got banned. But in order to get around <laughs> this, what we did, it, it was like silly bands. I don't know if you guys remember silly bands from way long ago. But oh, like, yeah. it, it literally got on the banned toy list. So then what we had to do is we had to like, we had either modified cubes in order to like make them quieter. So like, you know, like sanding them down and stuff. Or what we did is like, I remember the, Sh the Shengshou Aurora was really popular in those days just because it was mm -hmm. quiet enough where you could play with it under your desk and not get caught by the teacher. Oh my God. <laughs> did, did you guys ever cube in school? Yeah. I mean, I also cubed in school and they never outright banned it, but I do know that the cube I had, which was like a Zanchi at the time, was very loud. So, yeah, I can definitely relate to like teachers giving you the side eye. What was it like a big thing in like your school? Uh, for me, it was actually interesting because it blew up in my high school the year after I had graduated. So, oh, interesting. So, uh. like, I went to my first competition my freshman year of college, and a lot of the people a year younger than me who were still in high school showed up, and they were telling me. Um, like, you know, it's spreading through in my high school, even though I wasn't there. And like, oh, if you were, if you were only here for another year, you would like be the one teaching us all. Cause I had been cubing for like two years at the point. So I was faster than all of them. Um, how do you start? Uh, I started, actually, I'm thinking about this and my story kind of just changed in my head. Cause I remember when I was in elementary school, some parent gave me a two by two pocket cube which it was like transparent as a gift for christmas or something and i learned how to solve just a two by two through some online tutorial but like nothing else and i guess kind of like both of you i just stopped doing it for a very long time and then in 2013 i think during spring break i guess yeah that's around the time that i was like taking a hiatus from making youtube videos so I just like realized like I, if I know it is all the two by two, I should learn how to do the three by three mm. because that's the legit one. Yeah. And I know that my first solve was on April Fool's Day, 2013. Wow, that's, how did you, like, how do you really? Remember? Is there a story behind that? Oh, it's, it's because uh, I, I have this software that like graphs my timed solves. Oh, okay. And like the very oh, first okay. one is, is like April 1st, 2013. It's like four minutes or something. <laughs> Wow, you, you have, so you, you like keep your solve history from all the way back then, or is this like an old program that you used to use that you don't use anymore? Yeah, it's an old program I don't use anymore, but back then it was like, I would have like a timer on my phone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, just wait. I, I don't know, <laughs> my phone notification just showed up that I don't want. Yeah. We can come back. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. We can blurb it. I mean, yeah, we can, yeah, yeah, we can blur it, yeah. Now it's okay. Now there's no notification. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like I got, you know, I, I had the, the old you know, stopwatch app, and I would just take screenshots of my times. So, ah. like, I don't have a sophisticated yeah. time. I didn't have a sophisticated timer back then. Yeah, yeah. Right. The, th those are like the the old days. Those are like the Wild West. I remember like going on YouTube back in those days and just trying to like piece together what was going on. How did you guys like learn to solve the cube? My first video that I saw was the Dan Brown method. So I used to be Green Cross solver actually. Way, way, oh. way back in the day, because he started with Green Cross. Yeah, um, I know about Dan Brown's video, but my first tutorial was me, myself, and Pi. Ah. <laughs> yeah, because, um, yeah, I think, actually, yeah, so he, he had a tutorial on a 2x2, two two, so that's how I first learned. And actually, that 
I'm remembering now, it wasn't elementary school, so I just want to correct that. It was probably like late like middle, middle school. school. Yeah, middle school. Yeah. But I just remember uh, he had like really fancy transitions that would like flash yeah. on the screen. So yeah, I was, like, wow. fancy for 2013 times, right? Yeah, because his tutorials were like back then, JPerm didn't exist. Yeah. And and like a lot of other tutorials didn't exist. I think um, probably I don't recall using videos to learn how to solve the cube, and that's because I was in China, and then YouTube was blocked. Mm. So my I definitely remember using the manual that was given to me. Um, I don't think that explains why I'm a green cross solver at all. Yeah, I'm not really sure how I turned into a green cross solver, but I know for a fact those manuals definitely do not recommend green cross. Like they always start with white. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I have no idea how that happened. But as far as like when I came back, like I came back to um, cubing, I definitely have no idea who I watched. Um, no recollection whatsoever. There were like so many, at the time when I started, there were already so many resources. Yeah, I don't know if you guys remember Cubing World. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah I man. Do. Those are so, because I remember back in the day when I was like learning how to cube, I wanted to learn how to do every event. And I think many, many, man, this must be easily like 10 to 12 years old now. There used to be this series about like how to get fast, I think, at every single event. And then they had the either world record holders or, you know, someone who was like really, really good at that specific event, um, you know, teaching you like, like, you know, this is, this is how to get good. I think, um, I remember for three by three, I think this is how old this was for three by three. The guy who did it, the presentation was Andrew Ritchie. Oh yeah. 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 He used to have NAR. Like, yeah. 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 He, he used to have the NAR way, way, way back in the day. So. Yeah, I remember Cubing World, another one that I used to watch a lot. And this, actually, I transferred to White Cross because I was watching his videos. Did you guys ever watch this uh, YouTube channel called Bad Mephisto? Yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. I don't know uh, how to pronounce it. I never knew how to pronounce Mephisto. it. <laughs> so I think it's, so I remember because I remember because I, I like watched every single one of his videos. So it was, I think the name comes from some Diablo 2 character called Mephisto. Which I guess is also comes from like Mephistopheles or something. Anyway, and then he was like, I wanted to be like kind of cool, right? So I wanted to put something like, you know, I want to be like some like cool Mephisto or something. But apparently that name was taken. So then he the, then he became bad Mephisto instead. And then he had loads of videos. That that's how I first learned about F2L and like you know more advanced cubing methods instead of just you know just doing like like Daisy method or whatever I was Daisy. doing back in the day. The yeah, Daisy yeah. method is so reliable, though. Like, it's yeah, just like, yeah. I, I mean, like, yeah, it's, a, yeah, it's, it's super easy to teach to, new people. Yeah, it's easier to convey to, like, a beginner. Mm -hmm. um, but did you know that Bad Mephisto... I, okay, I could be wrong about this, but I think, like, the real guy, Andre Carpathy, is now yeah. the head of AI at Tesla. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think so, so that, that is true. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> think so. I think I've heard about this. <laughs> the, the crazy what? part is, the crazy part is, right, like, one... So... I, you know that this was like back in middle school days when he was posting those videos I took all of high school off cubing because my parents were like you need to focus on high school and not be like you know an illiterate idiot so but then when I came back to cubing in 2016 I was re-watching some of those videos and then he made a couple other videos about you know like where he's been and stuff and then he's like yeah like uh, I think at that point he was going to Stanford to he was a master student at Stanford or maybe a PhD student then I realized that, like, then I saw Andre Karpathy, like, just a name somewhere totally different. I think maybe he was related with OpenAI at the time. And then I've linked the two. I'm like, wait, this is the same guy I would watch in the Rubik's Cube videos. <laughs> oh. And then I'm like, wait, wow, that's amazing. Just to, like, just like, I don't know, I guess the world's like a super small place. Does yeah. anyone else know that? Was Is that, like, technically, let's do everyone, I did not know that. I, I don't know how I knew that. Um, but I do wonder if Andre like still cubes or if we can ever persuade him to come to a competition. Oh he's probably my so goodness. Busy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. He probably like Imagine talks to Elon just... Musk every day. Yeah, what if yeah. he just, con what if he convinces Elon Musk to sign up for a comp? Oh my goodness. Oh my God. Well, that, that cubing is going to the moon. 
Yeah, cubing yeah. is going to the moon. Cubing first, is coming with us to Mars. First Dogecoin and then... Oh, if we if, if humans coin? go to Mars, will there be Martian records? Not just yeah, like that, that, North that's, American yeah. records. Yeah, yeah, because we have world records, right? But what about Martian Inter records? I mean, the humans that would live there, you would call them Martians, right? Well, also, like the other thing Martian. is, think about like the way that like the physics would work, right? Like, I wonder if solving a cube on Mars would be physically different. I guess because like here, oh, we, yeah, because we don't need to like have like a spacesuit or anything, right? Like, we we just cube. But like, if you're on Mars, I guess like if you're a human living on Mars, you need to have some sort of like protective suit or something. That's definitely gotta affect your dexterity. Or if it's like super far in the future where we have like evolved species that can like oh. live on Mars without spacesuits, then they're <laughs> it's just a separate species, right? So then like, it seems reasonable that there should be a Martian record. Yeah. That, that sounds very sci-fi, like, or we're going to the part where, like, the well, evolution has Yeah, changed. we're also assuming that cubing is going to survive that far into the future, right? Is it, yeah. But is, I, is it I, that no far? Idea. I think if we, if it's far enough <laughs> to the point where humans, like, diverge, like, Earth humans and Martians become, like, separate species, I think that's going to be really, really far in the future. I, I mean, Speaking like, of, evolution well, takes, one oh. time, one, sorry, one time there was a comp, and then... If you can't solve a cube physically, you can solve it virtually. So Lucas Garren brought ah. his VR headset. Carrie, were you here for this? I I did try out his VR headset, but I haven't heard of this like if you can't solve it physically, you're allowed to do it virtually. Well like not a not a like um a not Mars I mean. Like how are you gonna solve it with like all the uh, contraptions on your you know, all your gloves and everything, your spacesuit? So you're just gonna start with, like dragging like the swords to lightsabers to turn the layers on the virtual headset. I think that if if humans actually go to Mars, isn't it just a lot simpler just to have a sealed off kind of room that has you know, oh, pressurized air? Actually, yeah, you're right. Yeah, of the same breakdown of Earth's atmosphere, and then like, right. you can just pretend. Yeah. You yeah, just you would just do it inside like your your base or whatever, right? You don't need to yeah. do it out in the Martian air. Okay, well, yeah. that, that seems reasonable. Well, considering that, then again, we also do have different records for like Asian record, European record, North American record. Yeah, even I though mean, it doesn't Is Mars doesn't really that different than a continent, right? I guess if anything is a super continent. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the national records and the continental records don't actually mean... Oh, okay, I, got, I gotta be careful with what I say. What I mean is... No, unfiltered, Carrie, be unfiltered. What I mean is that like... <laughs> You know, you can be proud of a national record, but it's not... Oh, I, I don't know if I should even... Like, there's, there's no... We're not okay, separating Carrie's them because of biological here. reasons. Like, you know, you're just like the, the, the record holder of the United States because you're just, you know, a proud American who wants to be the best of your country. It's not like we're separating them based on, like, biological differences. That, would, that wouldn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. I think... No, we, I... Yeah. I think if we were to... If... Okay. If we were to like, you know, separate cubers based on biology, the one that would make the most sense to me might be age. You know, yeah, like age. especially like I think this has been discussed at least at some point, like a seniors cup or something like that, right? Yeah, where, having divisions. Yeah. Where where it's like you know like I think the one one of the numbers I saw just floating around was like 50, 50 and up, um, and then just yeah like having like a senior record, which seems kind of interesting to me. Yeah, because I think that is the most like deciding factor if someone can be fast or not yeah um yeah because like i guess just when you when you are older you know your body has changed in ways so you can't quite turn as fast mm -hmm. yeah if, if you're watching or listening to this podcast it is no joke like after you're probably like 22 or 23 you don't like improve with your dexterity it just doesn't happen. I don't know. I <laughs> it's wish. All, it's all downhill from there. It's all downhill from there. Like, you really gotta, like, there's a reason why all those cubers learn hundreds and hundreds of algs. It's because that's the only way they can get faster. But, um, no, but aside from that, I definitely think a big reason why you would consider a region faster than another region is just the amount of people competing. Like, it's just yeah. um, environmental factors. Like, mm. you're going to push each other to the limit as much as possible. So, like, while you can have, like, um, a record in a smaller country, maybe it's not as impressive 
as an NR as for the United States NR, it's it's merely because of just how many people are competing. I think really, yeah, just the the amount of like population density in a way and just competition, right? Yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. That, that's true. I'm I think trying I... to beat like I'm Max Park. I'm trying to beat Maddie Hiroto and Abba, like stuff like that, just pushing each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was just gonna add on to that. Like another factor <laughs> is probably how many resources are in the language of that country because like there's a ton of english tutorials now so any country that speaks predominantly english like those people can probably improve faster yeah no definitely i mean that's also to the point like when you guys see when you unbox your new cubes a lot of those uh tutorials mm. <laughs> they're in chinese yeah <laughs> yeah i mean that's why Chi maybe that's why like so many young Chinese speedcubers are like dominating like Ray Hong Xu. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, I mean, I swear to God, those guys. Well, I think another thing which is interesting is I feel like right now where we're in the state of like where the, the 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 rules for the pandemic are different across the world, right? Some countries are going on lockdown like faster than other countries. And, you know, some restrictions have opened where other places haven't. It's interesting to see like where these things are happening. So for example, I feel like in China, China, I, f I think has had many, many comps by this point, which is yeah. really interesting because like, it, cause then you can also, you can see like, we talked about this a little bit in the previous episode where like, it's like the pandemic effect that we're going to see on cubers. The fact that, you know, people have had so much time to like sit at home and either perfect their craft or get into cubing. I wonder if like looking at the Chinese results, if you'd be able to see something like that. I know another person who's gotten insane is, first of all, Maddie. We already mentioned him. And yeah. also Timon. These two guys have completely, like, changed the entire game over the course of the pandemic. Yeah. Timon is definitely, definitely next level. Like, his, he, he's like, he thinks different. Like, the way he solves, it's different. Yeah. I, I mean, I wonder if, if like, starting young is helpful not just because you have more time and and maybe might like you said chai that you're more dexterous but also i don't know it's like learning cubing is like learning a new language and with language they always say that you know if you learn a language after puberty you'll never quite be like fluent in the same way as someone who like mm. was born with it yeah like you train your brain almost in a way yeah yeah like your brain is like creating these neural connections and if you're like still before puberty it's just much more plastic so i wonder if like the young cubers are also benefiting from that yeah i mean i could see it yeah because that, that's another thing that's changed quite uh significantly i think when i when we when we first started cubing at least when i first started cubing it was a lot of like people who were so i i think i was maybe 14 or 15 when i first started cubing okay. and most of the people at that competition were older than i was <laughs> older than I yeah older than I was um, and that, that was back in 2013 but now when you go to a competition it feels like if you're 14 or 15 you are maybe the median age if not in yeah, the already. upper 50 uh, upper 50 percentile right yeah I mean, yeah yeah exactly I think YouTube is um, a big reason for that because YouTube is just very accessible for children mm-hmm I definitely think that using like sports terms, if you're 14, 15, 16 years old, like in terms of your skill, like that is your prime. Like oh, that's no. your, that's just your yeah. prime, you know what I mean? So like um, people who are solving at their best, they're solving when they're 16, 17, 18. Like, I don't, I don't know, like is that, do you guys find that the best cubers in the world are like that much older these days? I mean, well, Felix is an exception, but... Yeah, I was gonna say, so, by that, are you, go like, are, are you also willing to argue that, like, Felix has fallen off from where he was a couple years ago? I, I don't mean, know would if you I argue, would... would you argue LeBron fell off in the same way? No. But, he, but he's definitely not the best player in the NBA, right? Uh... Debatable. Maybe for a separate... Right. Maybe for a different right, podcast. If, if you're watching... Let us know what you think. If you think LeBron's the best player in the NBA, maybe for no, a, but maybe for a different episode or maybe for a different podcast all entirely. But yeah, I don't know. I, I I sort of see what you mean though. Like, like yeah, it seems like right now cubing is really really dominated by you know these people who are, I mean I guess they're kids, 
um, you know, like the, the 14, 15, 16 year old kids. But I don't know if I would go as, as far to say that like that is like your prime. I think that there are, are probably, in, there are almost certainly many cubers who are like outside that age range who are still, who are probably just hitting their strides. Mm. Yeah, probably. I mean, it's not like you fall off after like you attack. The reason why you'd fall off after you hit like 20 years old is probably because of college. Yeah. Nothing like physical, nothing physically. Yeah, I think, I think yeah. th to me, that's, the, I don't know, that that's, I've always thought that like time is probably the most important thing. Which kind of makes sense, right? Like, the more time you can devote to something, whether it be like a language or a sport or cubing, the you're naturally just going to be better at it, just because you just have more reps, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I guess I, I don't like the thought that like the human body is already starting to decay by like early twenties, because I guess I'm past that already. <laughs> um, but I remember like Ro Hessler or some other OG cuber mm -hmm. was already talking about like somehow like feeling it in his fingers that like he just couldn't turn as fast and like i don't know what that feels like that's maybe interesting. I, it's like a subconscious thing that's interesting because i feel like may maybe it's true but what's what's also interesting is that like because now somewhat recently at least like i think ro has been really getting into multi the blind right yeah yeah so th that's actually kind of cool it maybe it's like sure like you lose some dexterity in your fingers but maybe like because of like your heightened mental acumen or whatever you can now like kind of access these events that you know i think mo most kids don't really take place in like the blindfold big blind events right but maybe yeah. like now because you're older you have a better spatial awareness maybe or memorization skill perhaps yeah yeah that's interesting um that reminds me when you're talking about multi-blind that just made me think of graham and how he started um, yeah and he's an example of someone who like hit his stride in he's his, still yeah, getting better he's, yeah he's still getting better he's still, he's still, still, still in his stride <clears throat> yeah Graham, if you're I mean, watching this i'm not i'm not implying that you're oh my god i, I gotta be <laughs> careful what i say no no Graham is like improving yeah which is yeah. crazy and and um i remember i think we were like one competition apart from like our first competitions it was just one or two of the berkeley competitions yeah and, like we were like the same level and to imagine that this guy is the the best in the world at what he does and he's yeah. still getting better is it makes me feel bad <laughs> yeah well i, I think graham has a very like oh, methodological man. way of like tracking improvement because you know, a lot of people yeah. when they practice, they just like do the same thing over and over again. Yeah. But I think he actually you know, like writes down every mistake he makes when he does a multi-blind attempt and tries to figure out like, oh, is this letter pair not memorable enough? It's very uh, kind of like logical and meticulous. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm there's like different ways to practice, right? Oh, you think there, wait, there are or there aren't? No, they're like different ways to practice in a sense, like it, it's just some people will improve merely by just spamming their spamming their yeah. attempts, right? Well, I think that's what kids are good at, because kids don't like planning, they just do things over and over again. Yeah, yeah. you know what, it kind of, it's, what's interesting is like, okay, this is, this is a weird analogy, right? But for example, like, I don't know, like, when you, if you guys ever played the Pokemon games, like, when I was younger, I wouldn't, I, I didn't really know like the type matchup chart or anything. I would just, just like grind, right? And then I would just like raise my Pokemon up to like high levels and then I would just kind of just do the same thing over and over again. But at some point, like when I got older, I'm like, this is not efficient. There is, there is a better way to do this, right? So then that ends up like being like, okay, I need to like memorize the type, type chart. I need to like go into this battle. I need to, you know, figure out, okay, like this is what I'm going to do for this battle, right? Might maybe yeah. something like that for cubing where it's like, you know, as a kid you're just you're just grinding. And then at some point you realize, okay, like I'm not getting better, but then something in your head clicks, it's like, okay, like so for me, I had this big realization in twenty seventeen when I wasn't able to break sub twenty. And at that point something clicked in my head where it was like, Okay, look ahead is my problem. I need to get better at not doing this not looking at what I'm doing right now, but how this is gonna affect the pieces in the next step I'm going to do. And that was like a big like unlock for me. So I think yeah. I think kids are pretty good at just like doing things over and over again until they find like the one golden ticket. Whereas like adults I think might need to 
might, might need to like think more analytically and kind of like more like analyze like okay like here are all the parts of my solve They're like you know there's like pauses or like this alg is inefficient or i didn't do this case properly things like that i think i don't know mm -hmm. yeah um carrie do you um do you remember when your first competition was yeah it was november 11th 2015. actually what's <laughs> that's so precise you remember it down <laughs> to the day Oh, I'm gonna be wrong. Watch me be wrong. But what, I, like, like Chai, when you were talking about how like you and Graham started at the same time, what freaks me out is that like Graham Stiggins uploaded a video of his first official blind solve, which was a year after my first official blind solve, and like back then I was like faster. So there was a time when, like, he was on the come up and I was technically. I had a, a little more experience, but you know, he just took it to the moon. He just kept going. Yeah. Oh Jesus. So you started in like twenty. So your first comp was like twenty fourteen then, twenty fifteen. Um, Manu's or mine? Yours, yeah. Mine was twenty fifteen. Oh uh, okay. Yeah. That's cool. I remember I went to the first. I think it was either Berkeley Fall or it was Berkeley Winter. It was. It I was actually, Fall. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I came to the competition with my roommate at the time oh, uh, huh. in, co in college and then uh, we were just like hanging out with each other while we were waiting for our solves and everything and I think it took me until maybe the third or so comp to really start opening up to people that like including like Manu I think Manu were you there already or not I was almost certainly there I, I feel like yeah, I you're you probably staffing or something I feel like I remember you from those days <laughs> it, was a, it yeah. was a very different Michael Chai I was very Wait. quiet yeah yeah. <laughs> well, yeah extremely so which comp because wait chai i think the first comp i saw you at was the one where you were wearing an apron <laughs> that it, was the first <laughs> that was the first one was oh, that the really? first one that you met me well i don't know if i actually talked to you but no that competition was sack two okay sack, sack two, two or okay. three sack two three four one of those it was the one where it was in like a weird plaza. It was yeah, three. It was like a huge, huge three. That was the one with the awful lighting. That was the one where I, oh that was Carrie. That was the one where I won Mega Minx. So yeah. Best of one song. And that was your best competition. Oh yeah 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 yeah. I'm I sure remember that, that. Yeah, I remember that. Um, yeah. And I remember you got in second, and we were having a no. There, we definitely met before that, or else we wouldn't oh. have had the conversation about who's gonna win at Mega. Oh maybe yeah. Would don't you think? I feel like yeah, we wouldn't well, have like done that. I sort of felt like by then you were already like in the community so you know if you're saying yeah. that like at your first comp you were kind of shy and like introverted i didn't I get really that vibe shy. i didn't get that vibe from you by that point when we were talking about mega yeah no i, I was definitely like a lot different and then when I, I mean i'm naturally just pretty introverted just like when i'm into something new that's how i tend to be yeah, yeah. Um, what was yeah. it um uh, and I think it took me until like the third comp, and then I, I didn't actually talk to you, Manu. I talked to Zod. I, I think I think first you talked oh, to Wilson, because then I know oh, Wilson. Oh yeah. Because because Zod and I <laughs> became friends in January 2017. I distinctly remember the first message Zod ever sent me was about magnets, about if if because because at some point I was like, yeah, I want to magnetize my cube. And I never talked to Zod. He's like, "Oh, I have some magnets. Do you want them?" That, that was the first me message he ever sent to me. Um, so I became friends with Zod in, in January 2017. Then I think you became friends with Wilson, uh, probably around the same time. And then yeah, Wilson and like Zod that. were friends, I think, uh, also around that time. And then that's how like we all like we came to know each other. If if you guys don't know, Wilson right now he's the he's the head of the. WCA competition announcement team. Mm -hmm. uh, also a delegate in Indonesia right now. But I yeah. knew about the delegate, but I didn't know about the other announcement thing. Oh yeah, he, he's yeah. you know he's, big bossing it up. He's uh, leveling up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but he's funny. Um, there's so many like we have a phrase, just classic Wilson, just like <laughs> just screwing up, you know, just being late to a competition, you know. Oh. Like. <laughs> imagine oh, no. he watches this, right? <laughs> no. I think Wilson is just Wilson. There's only good things about Wilson. 
Um, Wilson's man. a really good cuber. Like, yeah. he's really fast. Yeah. Well, he's definitely hit the retirement age of cubing. <laughs> like, he is so slow in comparison now. <laughs> Isn't he good at FMC? Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's pretty good for old standards. I mean, these days with Domino Reduction. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's anything right. anything is possible. <laughs> oh, I just that's remember. Right. Like, I, I, I posted on Facebook about, like, like, finishing like every single event in the in the wca right. i remember that and then, yeah yeah and then like wilson was like you got like i can help teach you how to improve fmc because i had like a 41 mean or something really bad um so i'm like oh that's the one that you're good at <laughs> yeah no yeah. he is good at fmc yeah. not anymore though i mean like he definitely would not be classified as like the best world class yeah man i remember the pre-domino reduction days when like you know, I, I remember like uh, I guess people probably I don't know I don't know anything about domino reduction. Do people does does it work similarly to like the old I remember NIS and uh, insertions. Does domino reduction work similarly? Is it like an additional step onto this, or is it like just a completely different method altogether? I think it's Pretty completely sure. different. Do you know, Carrie? Um, yeah, I think you try to reduce the cube to like where the top and bottom are like white and yellow mm. and then it can be solved only with double turns yeah that's uh, what on I was, left left that's right what I was front thinking. back and i don't know if insertions are still a thing there because you can't do commutators that only do mm. quarter turns then right so i don't know if it's like you have to throw out any insertion knowledge um but that's why i guess we're not fmc gods yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, we're not, we're definitely not. Not, and forget so gods, I'm, I, I don't know, <laughs> extremely mediocre. I, I remember, yeah. like, going to comps, right, and I'd just be like, yeah, I learned this thing called NIS, because I think the first time I ever competed in FMC, I just, like, did, like, some CFOP solution. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to use NIS, and, you know, I, I know how to do this. And then I sat down, I tried to do NIS, and then it didn't work. And I was just like, okay, well, I guess I'm taking DNF <laughs> on this one. I, I think uh, yeah, that's the like, thing about like FMC is that you, people don't really practice at home, so sometimes like, you don't know if it's gonna work until the competition yeah. is started. I, actually, we we should explain to for for non cubers So FMC is fuse moves competition or fuse moves. I think it used to be called fuse moves contest, but then it changed. I, anyway, I thought it was fuse moves challenge. Yeah, oh, it is yeah. challenge. Okay, in any case, I think it's yeah. It's Basically, you want to solve the cube in as fuse moves as possible. It's like um, it's it's like being a computer, right? Like you want to just give the most efficient solution. And, uh, you know, there are many ways to do this. You can just, if you just do like your normal solution, for example, a CPOP solution, I think CPOP averages around, I think if you do it somewhat efficiently, you can get like 60 moves like pretty easily. Um, then obviously there are like other methods. I think Rue, if you include M slices is like 40. Yeah, and then four, ZZ yeah. is, I think like, I think ZZ is also between 40 and 50. Um, but then the, there are other things that you can do, and there are some very interesting things with the way that the cube is set up that have to do with a lot of more like math and group theory. And there's one method called NIS, which is normal inverse scramble switch, where you solve the inverse scramble of the cube, and doing some stuff there gives you more, not more information, but kind of like, well, you can use that information to solve the normal scramble of the cube in a slightly different way, which can be more efficient. So, because I was trying to learn this, so I think this is a really interesting concept and I still don't really understand it mathematically, like how it all works, I'm not that smart, but the way, like when Manu says inverse scramble, in a sense, when you scramble a puzzle, um, you scramble it, like say for example with two moves, in order to return to that state, you want to do the inverse of those, not the inverse of those two moves, you want to do those moves in, reserve, uh, in reverse. So if you yeah, think about think like this, this, you think about the solve state and the scramble state as like a gigantic circle. Yeah. This is a scramble, and this section is the inverse scramble, and then right, and yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. And then when you do this, you actually apply it backwards, and you get this like semi pseudo state that only exists in the ether. And then it, uh. it just gives you some cool stuff in the real world, basically. Yeah, I, I'm sure that at this point there are prob well, I'm guessing, but I'm sure that there are like many, many NIST tutorials out on YouTube, so you can go f feel free to take a look at those if you'd like. I'm sure, So I, actually I don't even know if they 
Maybe they don't exist anymore with with the DR and stuff, but... Well, I'm sure the old no, I'm sure they, I'm sure they both exist, because I do think Nis is has a lower barrier of entry than Domino Reduction. Mm -hmm. Really? Because I, I feel like Domino is so new that nobody has... Oh, okay, sure. people have made tutorials about it, but there's they're kind of like four already intermediate FMC solvers. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if an idiot like me can know NIS enough to do it in a solve, I'm pretty sure the 31 I got was a NIS one. Yeah. Uh, and I think I got very lucky because I got a ZBL. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's always nice when the last layer is just something very nice. Yeah, yeah. So if someone like me can figure out NIS, I'm sure it, it's probably not too removed from anyone who's trying to learn FMC. Right. Mm. But yeah, I mean, that was, uh, I think FMC was one of the last events I, I checked off. I know, Carrie, you've done every event. Chai, I think you've done almost every event as well, right? Not even close. Yeah, I'm, oh, really? I'm what are you so missing? away. I'm missing all the blind events. I'm missing uh, all the I'm blind searching. events. Well, that's it. Yeah, that's, all, that's only four else. events, right? I got, I got a clock result. Yeah, I yeah, got a clock result, did. so... Oh, yeah. Oh, you're. Are you DK checking clock? Me? Yeah, I'm checking right now. <laughs> you, you have a faster clock average than me, but I have a faster clock single. So, Wait, so we're average? even. Your average is 15.8, and your single oh. is 13.4. That, that's not bad. Not, not too bad. <laughs> I know. It's not Under too the bad. cutoff. Under the cutoff. Yeah, I guess I'm just missing blind, but that's a lot of events. Uh, yeah, it's, well, it's like what four events. Yeah, but I don't know how to do any of them. What about? Oh. I just thought of another one. Skube. Oh, you're oh. one of the Skube solves. <laughs> Dude, Skube oh, yeah. is one of the this easier things too. Yeah, Skube? It, yeah. yeah. Uh, Skube I'm going is... to quote, quote my dear friend, Brandon Harnish. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, Skube is a blight. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, so for, oh. for those of you who don't know, because Skube. Skube actually used to not be an event. It was not an official event. I think it was added. Yeah. Oh, January 1st, 2014. Okay, well there we go. It was added. Okay. So it, it, I I actually predate because my first competition was in 2013. So I actually predate the ex the existence of Skew as an official WCA event. But uh, yeah, one of our one of our good friends, Brandon Harnish. I think he had the world record for at least several months, if not over a year. Um, yeah. That, now he yeah. does does not like Skew anymore. <laughs> I mean, it, I believe the way that it works. Well, I mean, to be obviously, it's a personal preference thing, right? Yeah. Like, it's not objective, but I believe Brandon Harnish had the world record for a while, and was it immediately like the Polish started taking over the event? Oh, yeah, like, yeah. Like, they, did they invent the Polish sledgehammer? Ah, uh, I, I know the Polish <laughs> like, sledgehammer. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, it was inevitable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so Chai, do you think you're ever going to finish the profile? Get get all events? Uh, you know, I'm not gonna put it out of the question because I mean You got a long time, right? You... I mean, blind is something that I could theoretically pick up like in my late twenties if I really yeah. wanted to. Like it's not something I have to do now, but um like I think Graham is slightly older than me and he's he's rocking it. I just don't have the the patience to learn it at the moment. I mean, um, yeah, there's no I, point I've, in forcing yourself to learn it if you don't want to, right? So I've also had successful blind attempts. I think my PB is like seven or eight minutes. I just never continued to push down the barriers. By the time I went back to try it again, I had forgotten so much of what I know, including the letter scheme too, right? Mm -hmm. So right. I mean but it's so um You'd think blind solving is so hard, but conceptually it makes so much sense. Like, whoever thought of these methods, it's like a genius kind of thing. I mean, I don't know who thought of it, but isn't it like from like card games and stuff like that, the way they use letter schemes? Uh, I don't know if it's card games, but I think it's a lot closer to group theory in the yeah. way that like you, oh. you would learn group theory in college because you talk about like even versus odd permutations and like n cycles and like parody and all that. So um, I definitely think that someone who learned group theory in college is probably more likely to have developed the method. I don't know who did. I know that like Stefan Pockman. Yeah, I only know uh, Pockman, so. Yeah, started it in like 2000, some, like one, 2002, mm, yeah. I don't know. 
Yeah, Carrie, since you, I think you are basically the resident expert on blind, at least among the three of us. Do you want to explain the blind method really quickly? Oh yeah, okay. Um, I guess I have a scrambled cube, but I don't want to go too much in detail. But I think the idea is, um, for every piece, like every corner piece or edge piece, it has a position it wants to go to. So you just sort of look at the piece, and then you see where it goes to. And then like that will point you to another piece that like also tells you where it wants to go to. So it kind of creates a path around the cube. And then mm -hmm. in your head, you also have a letter assigned to every position on the cube. So as you trace out this path, you're also creating a string of letters, which you can memorize. And because there's only 20 pieces of the cube that actually move, the path will be around 20 letters long, which actually isn't that hard to remember. And... Like, this is the same way it works mnemonics. for bigger cubes, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you use yeah. mnemonics, right? You just build sentences or, like, whatever you can do to remember the letters. Yeah, yeah. So, like, every two letters, you will think of an image or some object. So, I guess, uh, well, let me think of an example. Like, EG would be egg for me. Yeah. And then, like, if you just do blind over and over again, it starts to get to the point where if you think of a letter pair, you just immediately see that image in your head. Mm -hmm. um, so then yeah. when you put the blindfold on, you have like 10 images in your head and you just kind of, kind of regurgitate through, through the I think same it's, 10. It's also easier to like see too on a solved cube. Like when Carrie is discussing like where a piece wants to go. Oh but yeah. Really, this, is the, this is the spot where this piece wants to go because this is a solved cube. So if I consider this piece right here, that position is home position. But like when it's scrambled, obviously it's not. The piece is somewhere else. So now the piece is back here. But the home position is still over here. And that position and how it's going there, that's what Carrie's memorizing, essentially. Yeah, and there, yeah. there are like algorithms to move. Like So here, really what we're doing is, it's almost like you're solving the cube sticker by sticker except instead of sticker by sticker you're really solving it piece by piece imagine you're sort of like taking the piece out of the cube and you're saying okay where does this piece need to go jamming it into that spot taking the piece that was there out uh and then finding where that needs to go and continue doing that over and over again until you just solve the cube it's actually not too difficult if you if you like you, you could probably come up with like a uh you could probably come up with this method yourself honestly if given enough time yeah that's a good yeah. um alg T perm is a good one to show, right? Oh, like, I'm how just... many pieces are you moving? Well, I, I mean, I'm thinking of an alg that only affects corners. Because the good thing about uh, these yeah. commutators that, you know, as Manu said, take a piece out and put a piece in and then force a piece out, is they don't affect anything on the cube that isn't mm -hmm. those three pieces. It's always three. So, yeah. like, this is a pretty common alg that I have where. Like, this is the buffer, like, this is kind of like where all the action happens, and you can see you got white, green, and red. And then I want to know where this is going to go. It wants to go between the white, green, and red centers, which is here. So mm -hmm. I think of that letter as C. And there's... I don't want to explain three style, like, on yeah, a podcast, yeah. but... Yeah, yeah. We're, we're basically, like, forcing this piece to go into that C position, and then this guy... Um, you know, I, we got to figure out where he wants to go, where I, they want to go. We don't really know the genders of, of pieces of plastic. But you just fall, keep doing that, like a kind of a chain reaction, until you get to the end. I guess, like, by no means is this easy. Like, because what Carrie's talking about with these commutators are, like, I think literally thousands, right? Yeah, I think, well, it's, it's like, I think 400 edge commutators and 400 corner permut uh, commutators. Yeah, so it's a lot, but like some of them are like the difference is like what? Like a U and a U2? Like, yeah. Yeah. So they're like very yeah. small differences, but plus, yeah, by no means it's is it easy. I mean, plus you can get away with like, you don't need to learn all of them. You can also just yeah. uh, learn just, I think you can get away. They're, they're, I think if you use old Pokemon, old Pokemon, you can get away with three algorithms only. I think you just need T perm, Y perm, and R perm. Yeah. I think, which yeah, are which I'll are just three it. three algorithms. But yeah, you you mm -hmm. can get away with only knowing three algorithms and being able to solve a cube blindfolded. So but yeah, it is it is very different than solving a traditional three by three. Mainly because 
you really, really need to know where all the pieces are going. And in order to be able to very, like, finely move pieces, like Carrie said, we want to only move the pieces that we really care about. We want to move the other pieces as little as possible. That requires a somewhat lengthy algorithm to memorize. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's fun. It's like you get the thrill of being a be beginner again. Yeah. How, how did you, when, when slash how did you get into blind? For me, I think, oh, actually it was like, uh, summer, oh, no, it was January 2015. So it was like right after I had applied to college. And I think I realized I have a lot of free time and <laughs> I've been cubing for a couple of years. So let me try something new. That's sick. Yeah. 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 I mean, blind is tough. Blind is also so impressive. Just like you said, I think before, um, how either four by four for me, but for you as three blind, just spectator wise, it, it's tough. It's a it's a tough event. I, I like it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also an event where people can, like, w where your emotion not emotional state, but like your mental state can make or break yeah. it for you. Because like, oh, it, definitely. Yeah. I I find that like if I don't get much sleep i can still get by doing other events fine but like three blind i just perform so much worse <laughs> now imagine you had to do that times 60 60, times 60. <laughs> then... yeah yeah for graham i'm sure that like um you gotta be like very careful you know how your mind is doing on the day before and the day leading up to a multi-blind event yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's to the point where, like, so as we mentioned, like, you're memorizing these, like, strings of characters, right? So one way to do that is, like, stories. I know that some, some, some multi-blind people, because you need to memorize a lot of letters. Multi-blind is basically the same thing. You take, th you take, uh, like, a 3x3 three three blindfolded, but you have to do it X a certain amount. Except you do all the memorization beforehand, and then you do all the solving after. So instead of doing, like, memorize, solve, memorize, solve, it's memorize, memorize, memorize... Solve, 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 solve. Mm -hmm. So, because of that, you can come up with a lot of stories, and you can store those stories in many ways. I think a very well-known one is Roman rooms or mind palaces. But then you also need to make sure to evict those guys out. So I know what some people will do is they'll do like a like sixty cube blind attempt, which is mind you huge, right? And then afterwards, in order to clear their mind, they'll just do a short attempt, like I think like two or five. And then the, that way, the third attempt, they can start fresh again, 60, after they've evicted all those unwanted guests. Evicted. Interesting. I, I, never even, I never even knew that was something that had to happen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, evicting. I, I, I know, for, like, from my experience, and I don't do multi-blind, but for, like, big blind, I will, ha I will cycle through, like, maybe seven or eight different mind palaces so i have my own home as a palace mm -hmm. but i also use like my high school and my college um and like i can't use the same palace twice in one day because otherwise i'll recall stuff from the previous attempt right what? And that just really messes everything up. i yeah. had no idea yeah that you need to cleanse your palate essentially <laughs> yeah it becomes yeah. vivid enough where you can you just see it there right and then 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 yeah you have to work hard to just evict them they're just un unwanted memory yeah, wow. like like an unwanted know. ex. Yeah. <laughs> Get out of here, block. Oh, no, I think that I think that uh, I know what time. Like you guys know what time it is now. I think it's pretty much time to go. Oh yeah, oh, we're talking about exes now. I don't know. Oh well, yeah, we're true. also talking about getting, getting stuff evicted, right? You know, if we keep this up for too long, the viewers are gonna evict us. They'll be like, they'll be like this, these guys are just yeah uttering like nonsense as always. Yeah. Okay. But, so, um. Is there anything else we we're gonna hit about like Cuban career and we already talked about first competition and the different regions we can talk about it we, we talked about like world championships so I think we crossed those all off yeah plus anything we didn't cover we can always come back to in future podcast episode yeah exactly cool well do we want to end this episode off soon yeah I think, I think so. we've reached our cutoff yeah yeah I think we have we have over inspected once again <laughs> As always, no, always oh, a man. always a pleasure, guys. I think I think it's really fun to just like, because these are just like the normal conversations I think we would have. So it's kind of cool to put it in podcast format, and hopefully the, the viewers find some of our some of our stories slightly interesting. Hopefully, maybe you can relate. 
Maybe you yeah. found one of the maybe one of the cubing things we mentioned interests you. Like now you really want to learn about FMC or three blind or something. That'd be cool. Yeah, yeah I agree yeah. with Manu. Um, like these these topics, they're very interesting, but they're also very niche. So mm -hmm. <laughs> Scube is a blight. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know I didn't know that Brandon was so anti Scube these days. Well, it's not even these oh. days. It's been for a oh, while. Yeah. For a while. It's, yeah. yeah. It's tough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Are we signing off? All right. I think we are signing off. Thank you for watching, everyone. All right. Goodbye. Goodbye.